This lesson will be on water and electrolyte or salt balance in the body. And the uh, salt that we're really talking about here is sodium chloride. And in fact, it's really just the sodium, the sodium ion that we're going to be concerned about in terms of the salt. So there's really just one way that you can get salt and water into your body, and that is going to be through your diet. Several different ways that you can lose both salt and water. You can lose both of them through your sweat, through your feces, through your urine, and the water you can also lose simply through the process of exhalation. The regulation of salt and water in your body is controlled by two different hormones. Both of these hormones are going to have an effect on the kidney tubules, and the two hormones that do regulate salt and water are respectively aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. This picture here is showing us a portion of the kidneys. It's showing us in yellow here a nephron or a representation of a nephron, and the rest of it is representing the blood. So what we do have is a significant amount of blood that does enter your kidneys, and that blood that's entering your kidneys, it is going to be filtered by the first portion of the nephron, which is called Bowman's capsule, and the very permeable blood vessels that are passing through the area of Bowman's capsule, they are called the glomerulus. So there the blood is going to be filtered, and just like any filter, that means that smaller things are going to pass through, larger things will remain in the blood. Those larger things that are going to remain in the blood include your blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells. They include platelets, uh, fats, proteins. They are too large to pass through the filter. Pretty much everything else, though, that is dissolved in the plasma is going to pass through the filter. And that does include water, and it does include sodium as well. So that is the first process involved with the nephron. A couple of other processes that are shown here. Uh, number two. What this is showing is that what has passed through the filter has become part of the filtrate and would eventually be excreted out of the body in the form of urine. A bunch of it is pulled back. And when it is pulled back and returned to the blood, that is what is referred to as reabsorption. Another process here, uh, not one that is really related to water and sodium, but the opposite of reabsorption, number three on this diagram here, this one is secretion, and this is where additional things in the blood are going to be added to the filtrate, and that it might include things like hydrogen ions. What you find at the end of the nephron is what is going to be excreted out of the body, so that is the number four here, excretion of the filtrate, excretion of the urine. After the blood has been filtered, after some things have been returned to the blood, and other things have been added added to the filtrate. This one here is a more detailed picture of the nephron, so everything that we see in the blue shade here represents the tubules of the nephron. So beginning at the upper left-hand side, where we do have the glomerulus, which is being filtered by the first part of the nephron, Bowman's capsule, and then we have the various different parts of the nephron, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct. Eventually, this is going to end up in the renal pelvis, become part of the urine, go to the urinary bladder, and eventually be excreted from the body. So we can see at the left-hand side a list of all the different things that are in fact small enough to pass through the filter, pass through Bowman's capsule, and become part of the filtrate. Again, the ones that we're focusing on here, the water and the salts, the sodium, Part of the sodium chloride is what we're going to focus on. So if we take a look after the Bowman's capsule, when the filtrate is formed, we can see reabsorption taking place here with the sodium and the water already in the proximal tubule. In the loop of Henle, water, sodium being reabsorbed. In the distal tubule, sodium, water being reabsorbed. And finally, even in the collecting duct, we have more sodium and water that's going to be reabsorbed and returned to the blood, which of course means it's not going to end up as part of the urine. So if we take a look at the sodium first of all, the sodium is not just magically reabsorbed, it does need to have a hormonal signal, and that hormonal signal is going to be the aldosterone. So as we saw, sodium does pass through Bowman's capsule. Aldosterone is a steroid hormone, 
and that is kind of where this portion of the name comes from, the steroid. It is a steroid hormone, and steroid hormones can be produced by the adrenal cortex. We've seen some of these hormones before for blood glucose regulation, glucocorticoids as part of the stress response, the cortisol. Those are steroid hormones that are produced by the adrenal cortex. This one here, aldosterone, though, as we will see, is going to be specific for uh, salts. And again, the one that we're really concerned about here is this one. So it is going to cause sodium reabsorption. It is going to target the kidney tubules. It is going to make those tubules more permeable to the sodium. So the sodium can be returned from or to the blood from the filtrate. So if there is not a sufficient amount of aldosterone being produced, well, that means that the sodium is not being reabsorbed. So there's going to be a large amount of that sodium that would be excreted in the form of the urine. Nice picture here showing um, a number of different things involved with the regulation of sodium. So with all of the different hormones that we've talked about so far, as mentioned multiple times, you need to know things like the name of the hormone, the gland or glands that are involved in its production, the stimulus for its production, the target tissue of that hormone, the effect of that hormone, and the negative feedback. And this picture here, in fact, shows all of that for the hormone aldosterone. So if we take a look at the stimulus in the first place, the one that you really need to know is this one right here, a decrease in the sodium concentration. And this is in the blood. That is what we're really concerned about here is homeostasis of sodium in the blood. So when that does drop, that is going to be the stimulus. It's going to tell the gland, the adrenal cortex, Again, that is the outer portion of the adrenal gland to produce and release the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone circulates through the blood. Its target is going to be the nephrons, the kidney tubules. And what it's going to say to the nephrons is let's pull back a whole bunch of that sodium. Let's reabsorb the sodium. So once you do reabsorb the sodium and probably have some sodium ingested as well, that will bring the sodium back to the homeostatic value. And once you do get back to the normal value, you no longer need to produce the aldosterone. So there will be a negative feedback. The adrenal cortex is no longer stimulated and the production of aldosterone would then decrease. What quite often goes hand in hand with the regulation of sodium is the regulation of water. Uh, very similar to the sodium, water can be reabsorbed from the filtrate, returned back into the blood but this is also controlled by a hormone, a different hormone, in this case, antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that causes your body to lose water. An antidiuretic is something that tells your body to hold on to water. So if you hold on to water, that means you're actually producing less volume of urine. So this hormone here, antidiuretic hormone, is produced by the hypothalamus. This is one of the two hormones that we have talked about that involves the posterior pituitary, but ADH is not actually produced there. Again, it is produced in the hypothalamus. It is merely passing through the posterior pituitary. That is, that is where it is going to be secreted from. Its function is to increase the permeability of the nephron walls to water. So now it can be reabsorbed and it can be returned to the blood. So similar to with the aldosterone, in this case, if you don't have ADH that is being produced, that water is not going to be reabsorbed and there will be large volumes of urine that are produced, typically very dilute urine that is produced. In the presence of ADH water, yeah, it's going to be pulled back. It is going to be reabsorbed. So the important thing to remember here is more ADH means less urine. More ADH means more water is going to be reabsorbed. More of it is going to be moving from the filtrate and being returned to the blood. A couple of drugs here, fairly common drugs, ethanol that you find in alcoholic beverages, caffeine that you find obviously in coffee, in tea, in caffeinated pop, and a number of other things as well, including things like chocolate. Um, they do um, have an impact on the production of antidiuretic hormone, or at least the influence of the antidiuretic hormone. 
Uh, this condition here, diabetes insipidus, is a specific condition that does have to do with the ADH producing cells. So with diabetes insipidus, we do have those cells that are not producing the antidiuretic hormone, so water cannot be reabsorbed, and in this case there can be enormous volumes of urine that are being produced every day. So we saw the feedback loop for the aldosterone, and this is kind of a similar one that we're taking a look at here for the antidiuretic hormone. So once again, we'll start with the stimulus. The stimulus in this case, it could be a few different things, but the simplest one to think of is dehydration. You don't have enough water in your body. So what you do want to do is hold on to whatever water you have. You do have receptors, specific receptors in the hypothalamus that are for measuring the concentration of water, water and salt in your body. These are called osmoreceptors, and as the water concentration goes down, it's inversely related to the salt concentration, it ends up going up, and that is what is going to increase osmotic pressure and stimulate these osmoreceptors. We can also see here if you do have a drop in blood volume, a drop in blood pressure, for example, if someone is in an accident and loses a large amount of blood, this is also going to be the stimulus for these osmoreceptors. So this in turn leads to the hypothalamus producing antidiuretic hormone. It's going to be released by the posterior pituitary into the blood, circulates around until it eventually finds, once again, the kidneys. The target is going to be the nephron, and what the nephrons are going to do is they are going to reabsorb the water, and so it does say here we have increased water retention, that is the reabsorption of the water. So once you do get back to homeostasis, and that would probably more than likely involve the intake of water as well, either ingesting it in the form of fluids, or if someone is in an accident and they're receiving fluids through an IV and intravenous, that could also bring the body back to homeostasis. Once that is the case, you no longer need to produce antidiuretic hormone. So once again, there is a negative feedback. You no longer have the stimulation of the osmoreceptors. You no longer stimulate the antidiuretic hormone, and not as much water is going to be reabsorbed by the kidney tubules.